Okay, if you'd just like to start by looking straight at the camera, giving us your name and how you'd like us to accredit you. I'm Clive Oppenheimer and I'm a professor of volcanology at the University of Cambridge. So Clive, last time I saw you, or when we met, was in La Palma. Why, why were you in La Palma? I went out to La Palma, I think about the second week uh, of the eruption episode. And uh, of course, uh, I'd, I'd heard that it was rumbling through our rumour mill, our, the grapevine. And uh, some of my colleagues in France, who've worked a lot in the Canary Islands, uh, on, on the rocks, studying the ancient rocks in the laboratory, I got in touch with them immediately and said, look, this is kicking off. And uh, in fact, one of my colleagues has only ever been in the laboratory with volcanic rocks. He's never seen an erupting volcano. I said, you, you have to get there or your entire life has been lived in vain. And he said, okay, but you'll have to come with me. Uh, so I, I joined a French and Spanish team uh, out there for about a week or so. And uh, that, that's how I got to, to visit La Palma for the first time. What an extraordinary time to be there. Uh, it, it was very astonishing. I mean, I have worked on other uh, live volcanoes before, but there's, there's always something that you, you learn new that you never thought of before. Uh, and I'd been earlier this year in Iceland, uh, which, which was another long-lived fissure-fed eruption, uh, but not in the context where the lava is, is overrunning people's homes uh, and livelihoods. So a very, very different context. And uh, this was, yeah, very, very astonishing to see just how thick these flows were and how rapidly the situation changed uh, and many other things besides. Yeah, so before we dive down into the detail of the eruption, maybe just a quick reaction from you in that respect, because I think a lot of people who went there, us included, I think, came back with slightly mixed emotions on the one hand, so exciting about the science, but then actually you see the impact of the eruption and that's kind of quite hard to sort of put into words or to deal with really when you first come across it. Did that happen to you? Uh, I think I think when I'm working on a volcano, uh, I'm I'm there as, as a professional, it's it's what I do. So I suppose um, I'm very, very focused on, on the scientific work. Uh, and um, of course, in a situation like La Palma, uh, there's a humanitarian crisis going on and risk management um, that, that uh, very sensibly, you know, makes you know you don't put yourself in harm's way to make a measurement or collect a sample. Uh, so of course we we're working uh, very closely with with the guidelines, which change by the minute um, because lava flow low reaches another area. Um, but but when you're working, you're I'm I'm very focused on on what it is we're we're trying to measure or collect or record. So what were you trying to measure, collect or record when you were in La Palma? Um, in this case, for, for me, it was uh, really just to um, join this, this uh, French and Spanish team. And, and the main focus of that was to, to collect rock samples for analysis in the laboratory. And that will be to understand more about the, the magma reservoir, where it's located, what temperature and conditions uh, it experiences. And this, this is very important for um, unraveling what's the trigger of the eruption um, and what, uh, how, how has it evolved through time? Are there multiple magma bodies that are involved and, and hooking up to feed this eruption? How long might it go on for? Uh, so what follows from that is, and it's already on the way in France, is a lot of experimental work where you take um, a tiny sample of the rock, you crush it, make it into a powder, and put it in a little gold or platinum capsule <clears throat> and then it goes in in an anvil and, and an oven so you can take it to very high pressure and temperature that um, the magma would have experienced below the ground and you can do lots of experiments at different temperatures and pressures to try and figure out exactly where uh, that, that magma, that rock originated from. Uh, besides that I was interested to see the uh, degassing there was very vigorous uh, plumes of ash and gases being released into the atmosphere. Uh, and that, that's something I, I have specialised in is, is gas measurements. So I, I, I was really just, um, I didn't do anything, but I was looking to assess the situation with a view to uh, supporting the, 
uh, colleagues in the Canaries. And just again, just to have an overarching comment before we dig down into the detail, how did you feel um, you could carry out your job as a scientist there? Was everything well organised? Did you feel you were sort of, um, you were allowed access? Because I mean, there's been extraordinary access in one respect to to have a, a volcano go off right next to a town where you can just drive in and pick up your lava and go and have a coffee shortly afterwards. How was that for you, the actual experience of how scientists were um, accommodated, if you like? I think that uh, the, the situation there was very dynamic, it was very intense. There were many agencies, national, regional, local government agencies, World Food Kitchen, NGOs, you know, providing free meals for emergency workers. Uh, there are various groups of scientists, um, some affiliated with the University in Tenerife, which we were, uh, some with uh, Involcan, uh, and some with IGN. Uh, so, you know, there are lots of scientists doing different things, some obviously and importantly keyed into the operational monitoring and hazard assessment, whereas we were there more for looking at scientific opportunity, uh, which is, is something that will you know, lead to a scientific paper ultimately, but doesn't feed into operational management. Um, but I think I think things were, you know, from my perspective, things were well managed. Um, our crews were safe. Um, we 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 followed the the guidelines with authorization. And um, if the police said no, you you can't go down here at the moment because the, there's a lot of burning plastic in the atmosphere. Then uh, this was also, I think, managed if, effectively. Uh, given the situation and how dynamic it was. Excellent. From an outsider's viewpoint, it could seem chaotic. So many different institutions, agencies, scientists pitching up. Was it a bit of a free-for-all, do you think? I think the situation was, was something of a free-for-all because uh, people could still arrive there, so there's nothing to stop someone flying into Tenerife, even if they can't get to La Palma and get the boat across. Uh, and there they clearly were a lot of journalists uh, coming in, volcano enthusiasts. We met some on the on the boat, coming across from from Tenerife, uh, and I understand in the first week of the eruption there were about eighty drones in the sky, uh, uh, filming people's homes being overrun, uh, which is you know clearly uh, very distressing for the population that has been displaced. And I think I think that you know that had been calmed down and suppressed by the time I got there, but it's still still very. Um, yeah, very much. Um, you, you, it was. I mean, it's in interesting that the people that you meet there. We, when people have got a chance to talk for five minutes, uh, uh, I met some of the IGN uh, team doing the seismic monitoring and deformation monitoring. Uh, I also talked to the the World Food Kitchen uh, guy who had been on um, uh, Hawaii when it was erupting, and also in Guatemala, and you know. <laughs> found himself to have a, a lot of experience with volcanoes all of a sudden. That's actually somebody we're going to be talking to, World Central Kitchen, and I'd be interested in your view on that because, um, again, as an outsider, why do we need somebody like World Central Kitchen in La Palma when La Palma is in Spain, part of Europe? They're still there over two months on. Why has something failed? Have we not supported these families properly? Why do we need World Central Kitchen there? I, I think, I, I guess, why, why do we need World Central Kitchen? I, I'm, I'm a great believer in experts. I mean, they, you know, they've got a lot of experience. They know how to mobilize rapidly uh, with, with a, a crisis uh, that, you know, a disaster is, is by definition, or at least some definitions, um, a crisis that overwhelms the, the capacity to respond with, with the available resources. So, you know, if there are professional agencies that can get in you know, within 24 hours and set things up and support operations. I mean, we, we see this uh, uh, around the world that um, when, when situations become overwhelming, there's expertise, whether it's cave rescue, there can be particular equipment and so on, that not everyone has uh, the resource and apparatus to do this. So uh, I, I think it, and, and I think what's also important that it, and I'm sure this is the case with, with uh, World Central Kitchen, is it's, it's by invitation. I mean, People don't muscle in and say, right, you know, we're, we're going to do this. It's, it's usually on the basis of uh, we're, we're available uh, and if you invite us, we'll come. Yeah, it's just something people have commented on us locally because obviously people give donations, for example, to the Spanish Red Cross who are also there. But there's, you know, a question about, you know, why do we have the Spanish 
Red Cross and what is their role and why do we have World Central Kitchen here and what is their role and <clears throat> I think certainly in the early weeks there was a lot of, sort of crossover I think in some of the response and people weren't exactly sure who was doing what so it is chaotic isn't it the first few weeks it's by nature it's going to be chaotic a volcanic I think, I think emergency. <laughs> When a volcano go, goes off, you know, it, it's got a lot of potential to be cha chaotic. You know, it's not a good day to put your laundry out. You know, ash gets everywhere. The lava has obviously been uh, uh, running over property. And, and uh, so, yes, and as soon as people's lives and livelihoods are, are threatened, then, then it's, uh, it's got all the, the ingredients become even more chaotic as, as multiple agencies come in. And, and if there hasn't been... Uh, a lot of preparation and preparedness then uh, there's a lot of learning on the job and, and another thing with a volcanic eruption is uh, they can go on for a long time they can escalate they can look like they've stopped and start up again uh, so it's even the procedures that you establish after a week or two um, might be redundant uh, a little bit later on just because the, the situation on the ground has changed or in the air, you know, with a volcanic eruption. Exactly. And in La Palma, it's probably one of the most monitored volcanoes in the world. Alongside Teide, there, there's lots of agencies who monitor. But perhaps we weren't prepared for an actual eruption. Well, I think that preparedness obviously involves a number of components. It involves the monitoring, the scientific monitoring and hazard assessment. It, so that's, that's kind of at an operational level. Uh, it needs even longer kind of baseline work of uh, understanding eruption frequencies. So this is now studying the rocks. When, when were the historical eruptions? When were the prehistorical eruptions? What were they like? Uh, so, so there's a lot of scientific work um, that gives you an, an assessment of the hazards and things that could happen in the future. But in terms of preparedness, uh, I mean, I, I, I could have been monitoring La Palma or somewhere else and I, I could say well my seismometers uh, tell me it's time for you to, to pack your bags and get out of the house now. Uh, if that has no credibility behind it then it, it, that's not useful science so there also has to be a great deal of attention paid to um, risk communication, risk perception, the preparedness of the agencies that have to respond to a crisis, uh, how they're going to work together because they're going to be local, regional, national authorities and institutes and agencies uh, and and if, if you haven't rehearsed this uh, or, or had you know somewhat regular meetings to discuss how, how you will respond then you're learning on the job and you get things wrong uh, people get on each other's nerves or you feel they're treading on each other's territories I, I, made, I do the gas measurements here not you this kind of thing so so I think the preparedness it, it, it's almost always I would say after the event, uh, possible to say we you know we weren't as well prepared as we could have been. And that's actually part of what we want to do with this documentary. On the one hand, reflect a lot of amazing work that's been done um, in very difficult circumstances, sometimes with very limited uh, capacity, but also to pick on, on themes that perhaps we could do better in future. Um, so we'll we'll go through that a little bit at a time. But uh, you know, I think. Certainly, um, you know, there are events from El Hierro that we will talk about that, that we need to learn and that were learned and I think were put into operation successfully in La Palma. But, but going forwards, you know, there could be an eruption in Tenerife tomorrow or in five years' time, ten years' time, and that would be a completely different event, uh, obviously, in terms of population and so forth. Um, so from your point of view, before again, before we dig down into the detail of it, you know, how prepared, given what you've seen in La Palma, how prepared would we be for an event somewhere very heavily populated like Tenerife? I, I'm not qualified to, to say how, how prepared uh, Tenerife is, for example, uh, for an eruption. I'm not, you know, I haven't worked closely with, with people there. Uh, clearly it's, it's, uh, uh, it's well known that it's, it's a, a volcano, it's had historical eruptions, as have all the main islands in the Canaries. Uh, there's a lot of work um, by groups on, on the islands, there's also a lot of work by uh, their colleagues on the mainland. Uh, so I think I think the, the the bigger problem, which is a worldwide problem, is that uh, volcanic eruptions can be comparatively rare events, and the return periods are often longer than the timescale of somebody's office in uh, in government. 
uh, and so there are always you know, a million pressing things to deal with uh, in, in terms of policy uh, that, that a volcanic eruption that you know maybe there's a 1% chance that it's going to happen in the next five years uh, that's not going to be a high priority with education and, and uh, all sorts of other issues so I think I think that's um, that, that, that's the problem and, and preparedness doesn't go away you can't prepare now uh, and then think job done um, because in 20 years time you know that that knowledge and that um, experience is, is redundant so it's, it's got to be an ongoing uh, process. So from your point of view having seen other eruptions um, what should we be doing regularly to make sure we are prepared somewhere like Tenerife which welcomes I think uh, about seven million tourists a year in pre-COVID times? I, th I think if we knew the recipe for, for successful risk m mitigation in, in uh, volcanic crises then, then we wouldn't see the uh, the disasters that we still see uh, and uh, I mean it, it, I think it's very uh, very telling for example um, there were terrible um, episodes a few years ago with Krakatau which uh, you know, 1883 had, had the, you know, one of the most well-known notorious eruptions claimed 36,000 lives with tsunami uh, and a few years ago there was another smaller event and tsunami killed uh, elder people uh, in Guatemala as well, uh, the, that was another situation where there was a community within five kilometres of the, the summit of the volcano uh, and uh, I mean, as many as a thousand people were killed uh, by these ash hurricanes, pyroclastic flows that came down the mountain. These, these were hazards that were very well understood by the scientific community and we've, we've uh, published papers on them. Um, and but clearly that hasn't translated into the kind of political action that is required to protect populations. Uh, so what does it take to you know, try and have some success with risk management? It, it's obviously about the science, uh, but it's also about um, how that's communicated to the population that's threatened, uh, the civil protection agencies, political authorities, emergency services and so on. Uh, all the stakeholders need need to be in, engaged uh, with with the risk management, um, so that it's it's possible to go forward with with land use planning and and on, on all these kinds of things that you don't uh, you don't exacerbate the problem for the future, but also you have effective risk management in place uh, to to minimise the impacts when an eruption does happen. Um, so, what <coughs> things should the authorities now that we've got the the sort of the highlight on an eruption in La Palma, uh, we can take the opportunity to say, look, these are volcanic islands, you know, and this is what we should be putting in place to make sure we, the readiness is, is, is better for somewhere like Tenerife specifically. There, there are many elements to build preparedness um, in, in a community, both the public, the population that, that's under threat, um, but also the authorities, civil defence and so on. Uh, and I mean, many things have been tried in other other areas of the world. Um, one approach is uh, with with the, the local population to start with school kids. So you know, one teacher is going to see a lot of kids. Um, and I mean, for example, I saw in in Napoli um, on the slopes of Vesuvio uh, many years ago, where they they went into the schools and the kids were drawing pictures of volcanoes and their relationship to them. Um, but also getting across the message that, uh, well, yes, there's Pompeii, this hasn't happened for a long time, but this could happen again in the future. Kids talk about it at home, so then the older generations also get the, 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 mess the hazard message. Um, and so that, you know, this is one way to reach out into a community, uh, visits, uh, school visits to observatories to see the ongoing monitoring efforts. Um, in Indonesia, the, the staff in the Volcano Observatory go out to the community and they go to the villages and hold meetings and explain, you know, this is what we do to monitor the volcano. Um, this is what a, a yellow alert or an orange alert or a red alert, what, this is what it means and what you might have to, to do. So I think that's part of it is reaching out into the community. Um, I, think, I think one of the particularities with um, the Canaries, of course, is that there's a non-indigenous population uh, which swells the, the resources, um, draw, you know, draws on the resources of the island with all the tourism. 
um, who, so, I mean, you're not going to uh, give someone a one hour lecture when they arrive at the airport and, well, you are on an active volcano, so uh, if the alarm goes off. Um, so I think that's, that's another, another aspect and, and clearly, you know, there's also volcano tourism. People actually come to get close to a volcano, uh, Stromboli, Etna and places like this. Um, but I, I guess there are sort of other ways um, to, to manage that, uh, that situation where you, you've got a lot of excess people on the island who've, who've come there for a, a vacation. That's a really important point because one of the reasons we started Geo Tenerife as a private company was my frustration that nobody was talking about the Canary Islands being volcanic, which meant there was no real preparation uh, back in, you know, eight, ten years ago. Um, and in fact, my first meeting was with the president of Tenerife, and he said, Sharon, we don't want to talk about this being volcanic because it'll put mm. tourists off. Mm. Isn't that irresponsible? Uh, th this, is, this is a very typical thing that, uh, you know, as soon as you talk about a, a, a threat, uh, if, if someone's going to lose money because of this, then um, there's going to be a lot of pressure to suppress the message. And, I mean, this happened in... I remember famously, I think it was uh, in in California, uh, this big caldera system uh, started um, shaking a little bit and there's some swelling of the, the ground surface and um, I think it's a, it was a ski resort area and uh, the US Geological Survey got on and said, well, you know, it's an active volcano, property prices crashed and all the real estate agents got really very, very upset. So. Uh, it's it's difficult to have these conversations when, when people's livelihoods depend on tourism, uh, and um, but but I think you know again it's it's um, it, this needs discussion. It needs needs you know well what what's what's worse for your reputation? You know, there's more reputational damage in in, in having uh, some awful accident you know, than uh, um, maybe some messaging, uh, and I think you know. People do come to see volcanoes. I, I remember, um, I don't know, it was 10, 15 years ago now, there was um, uh, some increased seismicity on Tenerife. And I think, I think it ended up in an article in the Yorkshire Post, of all places, uh, <laughs> you know, in the north of England. And within five minutes, the story was now in Tenerife and, and the, uh, people getting very, you know, what's all this, what's all this going about, about it being an active volcano? Yes, because it's a huge tourist destination and we've had to sort of respond to all sorts of uh, headlines in the tabloids over the years. Oh, Tenerife's going to blow, cancel your holidays, or La Palma's going to collapse into the sea, New York's going to be wiped out, you know. And even though in the scientific community, uh, that's not the message coming out. It doesn't take much to take one or two pieces of information and blow it up into a sensationalist story. Um, but another aspect which is important, I guess, in terms of talking about this is there is no, I mean, there is a hazard map of Tenerife, for example, but there's no reference to that when people are either building or buying or selling houses. And the difficulty there is that if suddenly we say to people, oh, by the way, your house is in a super dangerous zone in terms of possible future volcanic uh, eruption, um, presumably they would then get stuck in a property that is unsaleable or the, the value would collapse. So how do we have that conversation? How do we start talking about uh, volcanic hazard without sort of relegating families and, 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 and you know having them stuck in an area that may or may not be in the way of a future volcano? Uh, they're very difficult questions about uh, hazard zonation and uh, you know Particularly, hazard maps tend to have boundaries, you know, this, and so you know, one side of the street is now in the high hazard zone, and the other side isn't. Uh, you know, one one of the ways that, that this gets controlled by the market, I guess, is through insurance. Uh, so, uh, of course, in, insurers look at uh, hazard maps and hazard assessments, and, and insurance premiums, you know, will will be based on on some of this sort of scientific underpinning of of the spatial hazard, uh, how it's distributed in space and time. But I think, I think they're, very, they're very difficult conversations to have. You know, if, if someone's 
in in a property and they've been there for generations uh, and and then are told well now actually we've we've just remapped this and you're you're in the hazard zone um i i don't think there are any 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 easy answers other than you know for for again for um to make sure that those uh, people are, are protected as far as possible through through monitoring operational monitoring and, and hazard assessment and uh, at least you know that people can be um, evacuated where where necessary. So is that our only line of defence? Make sure they can be evacuated in line of. Well, I mean, you can put up walls around properties, or you can build bunkers to to, to live in. But I think I think um, you know, volcanoes that that erupt every twenty fifty years. You know, it, it, okay, here there, it, it's it's. Um, it's rolling the dice if, if uh, you have a property on, on an, an act, an, a volcano that's known to be an act, active, uh, active one. Uh, and we see this you know, on, on Etna every now and then the, the flows come down into the settled areas, they cut the road, they cut the tourist facilities. Uh, and, and the hazard is not always at the crater at the top. It, it often um, in, in, in certain kinds of volcanoes the, the eruptions can come up on the flanks uh, where there are more settled areas um, and I t yeah I don't think there are easy answers we, we're not saying okay well we should um, close down Auckland because it's in a volcanic field I think all, all we can do is say well how do we we've got a, a threat here how do we how do we manage that great um, you mentioned insurance uh, and that's been a huge subject of much controversy in La Palma because a lot of these problem properties weren't insured mm. for a number of reasons. Uh, a lot of these properties weren't regulated. There were perhaps properties, very large properties, that they may have inherited from grandparents at the time of Franco when they didn't have to pay any taxes. And obviously, I think they were probably offered, a, I think there was a programme where they offered um, like an amnesty so that they could mm -hmm. put their, make their properties legal. But nobody signed up to it because then they'd suddenly have to pay these really heavy... Um, duties, taxes, back taxes, all sorts of stuff, and they felt, you know, once once we stick our neck out and make this legal, mm -hmm. everything's going to fly at us. Um, and from the outside, a lot of people say, but in that case, just sell your house and move somewhere else. But that isn't taking into account how people feel about the place where they live, mm -hmm. and there's a massive identity with these families to the place where they live, isn't there? Uh, again, around the world, y you see in situations where there's been forced evacuation, forced migration, you know, people will come back. Uh, Merapi in Java, in Indonesia, is a case where, you know, at what one point the, the government had the idea of, of uh, transmigrasi to move, move people out from the, the more risky areas, uh, and they ended up relocating people in Sumatra and, and distant parts of the archipelago. And, and many came back, and, and there were all, even studies that showed, well, actually the mortality was higher in these places where you sent people, you know, where they're having to, um, I don't know, <laughs> eke out a new, a new existence somewhere, uh, than if they'd been, statistically, if they'd been stay, stayed put on, on the mountain. So, yes, people have a huge attachment to place. Uh, I think that's, that's just part of the human condition. Um, I think the question of um, insurance is uh, and, and sort of legality of, of housing is, is a very, very tricky one and you know, it's the thing that I guess is going to occupy lawyers um, uh, for years to come, you know, maybe on, on the Canaries but, but elsewhere. Um, there's a similar, in, in, in around Vesuvio there was a lot of, um, it's called abusivismo, a lot of illegal development there in the 50s and 60s. And in, in the end, um, the government you know, established uh, a, a park um, to, you know, which made it easier to sort of prohibit further construction. Um, so you, I mean, on one level you could say, well, okay, uh, you, you know, you've built in a place where you shouldn't have built, so you're on your own. Um, at another level, if, if the government is providing resources, building roads to connect places, uh, opening schools for the kids to go to, then it, it's sending out mixed messages, and I, I think it's, you know, these things are just very, very messy, uh, and there's no, I don't know, there's a right or wrong. It's just very, they get, they've got such sort of history to them, 
and backstory and you know, money is is you know part of it and, and uh, lives and livelihoods are part of it. It's it's yeah they're just cans of worms I think that uh, that that's another part of the human condition. I, I, I remember um, I I used to visit Christchurch in New Zealand uh, quite often uh, for field work. And um, after the earthquake, uh, the, the whole central business district was kind of off limits. And uh, there were many, many buildings, many of the taller office buildings that were still standing. They looked absolutely fine. And, and it just was like that year after year that I visited. You think, well, you know, what's wrong with these? And they're, they're, you know, maybe there was a hairline crack or it just hadn't been decided whether they need to, needed to be condemned or not. And then if they were, uh, if they were um, structurally unsound, then insurance would come into play, otherwise not. And, you know, these things just get contested for, um, you know, for years and years and decades and decades. And ironically, I think there's no um, requirement to make um, buildings in the Canary Islands uh, earthquake proof. Mm -hmm. And one of the studies we were doing with some of the students in conjunction with one of the local institutions was looking at amplification. So you might have a, a series of small earthquakes, but depending on the type of, I mean, I'm not a scientist, this is me in my layman's term, apologies, you know, it can amplify uh, uh, the effect. Um, so should there be a requirement to understand better, because obviously a lot of the hazard involved with vulcan, vul volcanic activity in the Canary Islands is the seismic activity, mm -hmm. rather than necessarily the slow moving lava flows or perhaps the gases. Um, so should we be thinking about houses being, uh, like in other places, uh, built with that in mind? Uh, volcanoes are prone to seismic activity. Uh, they can have quite strong earthquakes that can be damaging. And so uh, it, it would be, I think, you know, fairly standard to, to also consider the seismic risk uh, as part, part and parcel of the volcanic risk. Uh, and you know, that might feed into, into structural engineering codes uh, and so on. It's not always easy to characterize seismic risk in, in, in the UK, uh, for instance. You know, we, we do have earthquakes. Um, they're pretty rare. Every now and then someone's chimney pot will fall off. Uh, but it's not very well characterized. Uh, and, and yet it does, it, it is a factor that is, you know, part of our insurance premiums are based on <laughs> this seismic risk. Um, and I don't know if this is the case now, but I think it used to be just a blanket um, seismic hazard across the country because it, it's just not been very well characterized spatially. And I, I could imagine again, someone like the Canaries, uh, what kind of a baseline of data would you need to, to say which areas are more seismically prone than others? Uh, because it could be quite uh, related to where there are fault systems and fractures uh, uh, and, and so on. So mm. it, it's, it's something that probably needs, needs further work. If we could just come back to, because I think from everything that we've been talking about, what's really interesting is um, what you were saying about insurance being a sort of self-regulator. Mm -hmm. But if all of these houses aren't insured, mm. then it's not working. So how else can we, you know, it, does that mean that we're failing people because they don't have any perception of whether their area is more or less risky? Do we have to somehow, I don't know, ensure that we help people to insure their homes or it has to be a legal requirement? Um, or do we need something else in place so that that hazard risk is taken into account? Uh, hmm. <laughs> I think when you know when it comes to insurance uh, as an instrument to to control you know where where people live, uh, of course a lot of people don't have a lot of choice where they live, and, and you know, there are many people live on floodplains who you know, maybe don't necessarily want to live on a floodplain in, in the, uh, off, often in slum conditions, um, but don't don't have other opportunities. You know, this is, Again, around livelihood, place, and 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 lack of other, lack of choice, um, and I, I would imagine you know, in in many situations, it's this, these are sort of uninsured properties, uninsured uh, goods, and uh, livelihoods, 
um, uh, and I suppose um, I suppose there's even a kind of uh, argument about um, liberty. You know, well, should I? You, the government's telling me I can't live here. Uh, well, maybe this is where I used to live in the, in the situation of La Palma. I want to go back where I used to live, and the government's saying, well, I can't. Um, should someone have the right to go back to where they were? Uh, if they do, should they have the right to be uh, to get insurance, even though you know, the, the, the hazard is is evident? Um, I, I, I think these are, they're very very thorny questions. I, I, I don't know where the right and wrong is. I, I think there are clearly cases where um, you know, developments, major developments, um, building housing developments, you know, will will have to take into account. Well, this is in a in a floodplain. There's increasing flood risk uh, and, under global warming, and um, yeah, people won't be able to get um, pay in insurance premiums if they so no one will buy these houses. So we're not going to build here. So I think I think insurance is part. It, it is one of the instruments that controls land use planning. And then that brings up a question of perception as well, because one of the things that was in the press was when La Palma was um, declared quite early on a disaster zone, uh, but they declared the whole island a disaster zone, but that is insurance speak to enable people to claim on their insurance. Mm -hmm. But it meant that internationally everybody went, oh my God, the whole island is a disaster and it's, we're writing it off. So on the one hand, it's quite a blunt instrument, isn't it? Uh, to declare a di disaster zone. Yes, because it, it, from the outside, everybody was horrified and thought the whole island had gone up in flames. So the messaging is important around that. Yeah, I, th I mean, messaging is always important in, in risk communication. Um, sometimes, though, you know, you're faced with uh, very, very difficult decisions, um, like do I evacuate uh, 100,000 people from this 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 city when the scientists are telling me there's a 10% pro probability that it's going to be overrun by uh, a pyroclastic flow. I mean, it, the, these are extraordinarily difficult decisions um, that will maybe always look uh, more straightforward in hindsight. Um, but I, th I think with a, a lot of these kind of decisions, you declare a disaster zone, um, things are done in the heat of the moment because you know, someone has to make a decision, something has to be done. and. Uh, it's very difficult then to control um, how this is perceived in the outside world. You know, this is going to be obviously a magnet for media hype, uh, and but but how how much can you how much can you have your focus on when you've got an emergency? You know, I, th I think you have to say, okay, you know, this will be spun in the media on the other side of the planet, um, but actually we you know, we need to care about the people who are here right now. Perfect. Absolutely. And um, it's also true to say that it's an extraordinary situation, this, in that we have a very accessible volcano um, right next to a town um, with extraordinary multinational interest in it, um, but a little island run by a cabildo, which is essentially a town hall. And suddenly these people have been thrust into the glare of international publicity that must be stressful to manage. It's very easy, as you were saying earlier, to say, oh, they didn't do a good job. Mm -hmm. But these guys, they're running a town hall and suddenly they're in the glare of international mm. publicity, having to make very big decisions very quickly under a lot of pressure. Mm. That must be very difficult. For, for the everyone involved in, in managing a, a crisis, an emergency, the, the pressures are phenomenal. Um, then they're coming at you from all directions. Uh, so. You know, when you're faced with making a decision, um, yeah, it, it, I I wouldn't want to be in that situation. I, and I've spoken to colleagues who have have done that, and some um, feel that they shoulder all the responsibility by themselves. Others, you know, like to um, work more collectively. You know, to almost sort of spread spread the responsibility. Uh, and even this, you know, this this is now something that can be you know, contested. You know, people can come back and say. After the fact, well, um, uh, we're going to bring legal action. You you uh, violated our human rights by evacuating us. Uh, you didn't tell us this could happen, uh, and so um, decision makers are also now they you know they're mindful that they can might end up getting sued by somebody. So it's 
Yeah, enormous pressure, enormous pressure. And you've got so many different agencies involved in this eruption as well. Um, speaking with one voice must be almost impossible. Yeah, I, th I think it's very difficult to speak with, with a, a single voice because there, there'll be so many opinions, uh, there'll be different scientific opinions about what might happen, uh, there'll be different opinions in the civil protection authorities on, on how to react, there'll be different opinions in the community about, uh, well actually it's, it's not so inconvenient for me to go and stay with my uncle over there or, or someone who, who really has you know, very limited options. So I, I think that, that, that there's going to be a flood of a chorus of, uh, of opinions, um, and, but a few decision makers are going to have to, have to call the shots and make, you know, make very difficult decisions subject to uh, the great uncertainty about. No, no one has a crystal ball to know how things will play out. Brilliant. And just very finally, before we go into the, after your 12 o'clock, we go into the detail, how much responsibility lies on the shoulders of the scientists? I think I think the, um, the scientific responsibility is. Uh, I mean, th this is something that I've I have thought about before because I, I worked with it with the Mon Montserrat Volcano Observatory, uh, and again, it's quite it's quite fuzzy because um, scientists, I would say, on the whole, uh, would not like to be the ones who say it's time to evacuate. Right? What they would uh, say is. This is what our, our scientific understanding tells us. These are the uncertainties we have. If you're asking me, is it going to erupt next week or next month? I'm not sure. Uh, is it going to go this way or that way? I'm not sure. But these are the scenarios. Um, that's really you know, the level that, that scientists feel comfortable. And we might go to as far as giving some probabilistic assessments. Uh, they don't want to be the ones pressing the button on the siren. Uh, to um, evacuate the airport, you know, and and um, this this then requires you know, good communications between the scientists and the authorities who who should be making the decisions. Um, but again, you know, it gets it gets messy. It gets messy, and and uh, uh, scientists do get more embroiled. You know, well, what I'm saying is potentially it's going to mean um, fifty thousand people um, are moved out of their homes. Uh, so, so as scientists, you can't, you can't pretend that's not, not happening. And scientists in volcano observatories are often part of the community that they're protecting. Uh, they often live there, they're with, with, um, you know, so they're, they're also threatened by the activity. And this is another dimension. It's not like, um, you know, like a sort of meteorological agencies that are often, you know, might be a thousand kilometers from where, where the, the hurricane's going to hit. Uh, so it, it can be quite personal for uh, volcano observatory scientists. So thank you, Clive. So we were going over the global issues, but now we're going to dig down into the detail, if that's all right. Um, so you've followed volcanic emergencies around the world. How is La Palma different? Um, I, I kind of follow what's going on, you know, when a volcano pops up, uh, not necessarily to go myself, but to, to see if one of my students might get engaged. Um, uh, we've certainly done that with Iceland rapid response. Uh, I, I've been involved in or around during various volcanic crises and, and you always learn something new. I mean in the case of La Palma there are a number of aspects um, that really really struck me. I mean one, one actually was just the, the sound of it. I mean the, the, the continuous roar from that vent even three kilometers away. Okay you could you could hold a conversation but you, you're only just, you know, and it, it would uh, go up a little bit in volume and come down a little bit, but it was, it, it, you know, it just was there all the time. And um, that, that's something that I, I think, I think if I'd been staying on that side of the island, that would have got to me after a while, you know, trying to get to sleep and coming around in the middle of the night and then hearing this roar. That was really extraordinary, um, something you really felt. Uh, and then things like, I mean, the, the, this burning plastic or this plastic sheeting uh, over the banana uh, plantations, um, I guess, to protect them from wind, you know, when this, this caught fire and the toxic clouds, I mean, that, I never thought of that as being a volcanic hazard, but uh, of course the, the stuff that um, is combustible, uh, and I suppose there are cases where lava is, has ignited um, storage of petrol in gas stations, 
in, um, in Merapi in, in Indonesia. Uh, there it was a case of question of pyroclastic flows um, igniting uh, fuel tanks on, on motorbikes, which, which people in, in the villages are often park indoors. So there were these, these uh, explosions which also caused casualties. Um, but they, so there's always something that, with ev every volcanic crisis, there's some dimension that you've never encountered before. Exactly, and this was something that we picked up in one of the interviews, because our expert, um, Alexis Schwartz, he was um, interviewed on the local television, um, just as one of the first massive, thick, acrid, black columns of smoke came up as it ran over a, a banana plantation. Uh, and it was just on the day where they were expecting it to hit the sea. So the presenter was saying, you know, oh, is it hit the sea? And he said, no, 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 that would be a white plume. This is actually far more dangerous and something that Pavolka hasn't taken into account because everybody thought it was going to be a bit of a Tenegia style eruption where it just sort of, you know, went down harmlessly through some vineyards into the sea. Uh, but there's all these added associated uh, hazards that nobody thought about, had they? With, with volcanic eruptions, they're, they're, they're multi hazards, and, and this is part of the complexity, I think, of of assessing and evaluating hazards and managing volcanic risks is because there are lots of things they can do. They, they can have flows, pyroclastic flows, lava flows, mud flows, where it's topography and gravity is, is the agent, the force that drives them. Uh, ash clouds, which are subject to the vagaries of the weather and the wind directions. Um, and then in the case of a, a coastal volcano, you could have a tsunami generated as a pyroclastic flow goes into the sea. Uh, so there are th these multiple hazards and um, you can have all of them you know, playing out at the same time. So it's, it's, it's something that really complexifies the management uh, of volcanic risk and the management of a volcanic crisis. You've got to think what's in the air as well as what's on the ground, what's at sea. Exactly. So we were all following uh, the seismic activity leading up to this eruption. I think there'd been nine previous uh, very specific episodes of seismic swarms. Um, what was different about this one that meant you know, it was really leading to an eruption? Is it something that you followed? Uh, yeah, no, I'm not well placed. I mean, I, I, I certainly heard in the week before that there was, there was uh, seismicity building up, but, um, and, and that you know, this was... Actually, my, my French colleague was in um, Barcelona, I think, uh, at a meeting with uh, Jean Marty, and, and yeah, they were aware that it, it was building up, but I, I don't know the, the details of the, the monitoring beforehand, um, other than that it, it yeah. But they were they, talking they about it, it leading to an eruption. They saw it coming, yeah, yeah, I think, but I, yeah, I'm, I'm not, it'd be better to get that from Someone Absolutely. No, it's just good to get the story right, because yeah. obviously this yeah. is a key thing in terms of monitoring that's, you know, we, we need to get right this time and, and in the future, because yeah. um, from certainly the conversations that I heard around me, people were saying this is going to end up in an eruption, but what came out on the television was, you know, a much more played down, watered down mm. message. How helpful is that? Uh, what's unhelpful is to have mixed messages and different messages from different experts and, and, and non-experts uh, and that, that's something that uh, you know, has, has played out in, in many volcanic crises and even non-crisis situations uh, and particularly you know there's a, a Yellowstone volcano uh, the US Geological Survey makes the data that they collect available so you know anyone can go any pundit can go in there and um, there, there. Uh, I remember the director of the observatory telling me that uh, there, there was a, a woman who used to put out these uh, YouTube videos saying there's an imminent super eruption coming, and probably there are more pro people following her channel than actually <laughs> you know, listening to the USGS scientists. So is this why they're not making, for example, the gas sampling publicly available from this eruption? Do you think? Oh, I, I don't know what the data policy is currently. I mean, it, it's. Um, when when you're collecting data in in real time um, you might have a very quick product uh, from it um, so for example with the seismicity uh, you can get a, every 10 minutes you sample the amplitude on your seismometer and that gives you a real-time seismic amplitude measurement um, gas measurements uh, you, you can you can come up with a figure on the day but you you might not want to release data because they haven't been checked quality controlled and so on. So um, 
yes, I guess I guess you know you would share data with um, with other specialists that you might want to get second or third opinions from. Uh, but I, I would say in, in some situations it's not necessarily helpful to make data in real time in a crisis publicly available because you'll, you could get any, anyone who thinks they're a, you know, a volcano shaman or a pundit um, you know, making pronouncements that, that confuse the message. That there, there has been a, a particular case in this scenario though where the data is collected by a very selected few obviously because they're the ones who are equipped to do it. You have other people taking some sampling um, but not at the coal face, shall we say, not within, very close in and with the right equipment. Um, how important is it that the sampling that's being done, that's for a privileged information at the moment, for the reasons you've explained, how important is it that that's then made publicly available at a later date so that all scientists can work on that? Or should it just be kept to the favoured few? Uh, generally, most funding agencies now um, mandate that, that data is, is publicly available and accessible and, uh, and this is routine now if you're publishing a paper, the underlying data need to be freely available that other scientists can come and see if they can reproduce the results. Uh, I think there are, there are clearly going to be situations where you might want an embargo period um, that, that uh, you know, if a, if a particular group has, has worked and uh, needs some time to figure things out and, and write stuff up, and then you know, a year later date, data are released. But it, it's clearly valuable to, to all uh, that data are, are available because um, you know, there will be scientists who want to go back to the La Palma situation or another one in, in five or ten years time and say well you know I'm seeing this going on in the Philippines is there anything I can learn from what they found out in, in La Palma can we compare uh, the observations and, and activity so so that that's I think just you know a general trend is towards op open data policies and also I think there's real value in having more people pouring over the same information because not everybody will follow the same process they might have a different way of interpreting something or they might come up with a different solution to to an issue so there is real value in making that publicly available isn't there not just having one institution doing one job uh, there, there's value in having multiple eyes on, on data sets I think where where it becomes um, trickier is where you've you've got um, I don't know people with vested interests or, or non non specialists who uh, and there are plenty of them around now if you put stuff out on the internet uh, it will be found uh, and someone can make some narrative about it that might, you know, gain some traction. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I'm a believer in citizen science, but, but up, up to a point I'm also a big believer in, in experts and specialists who've spent their careers uh, analysing and thinking about particular data sets and particular problems. And how do we keep an eye on those experts, though? Because what if they're also keen to secure their future funding, for example, and perhaps they might sensationalise their role or what they're doing because they have preferential access. Is that fair on, 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 on the use or is that a good use of public funding? There's always the possibility of, of rogue scientists and, and in, in the 70s there was a very famous case in, in Guadeloupe in, uh, in, in the Caribbean where there were opposing scientific groups who had very different um, prognoses for what the volcano was going to do and it was very public and very very acrimonious and had you know decades of, of lasting ramifications for French volcanology uh, and I think you know the, the, the way you get around the fact um, and, and we should expect this that different scientists will have different opinions and viewpoints different experience that they're bringing to analyzing a data set uh, what's needed is some kind of collective uh, way of, of pooling uh, opinions and knowledge that, that there's one one viewpoint um, you know, which may have lots of nuances to it and probabilistic terms uh, applied but something that everyone can say yeah it's maybe not exactly what I would have said but I can sign up to this uh, and, and so you know, th this is something that's been learnt um, maybe not learnt well enough but in, in many emergencies is, is you know civil protection authorities really want a single voice, they don't want a, a plurality of, of opinions on what's going to happen. And that sounds great in principle, but the reality is we have social media, we have individual scientists, we have their own personal accounts and suddenly certain things get sensationalised. What's the danger of that? 
the danger of things getting sensationalized is, is that uh, the people who do need to make decisions don't know who to listen to anymore. So uh, this is, again, I think it goes back to preparedness that you put in place the mechanisms by which you, you pull expertise and opinion uh, and, and you, you, know, you decide who, who your mouthpiece is, uh, who, who is you know, going to gather, gather the diverse opinions into uh, a more or less accepted um, prognosis perspective on, on what what the volcano is up to. Uh, so this, this kind of thing, you know, it's better if it's in place before you need it. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that this has been learnt in, in volcanological context, you know, that, that um, you need to put aside egos and, and work, work collectively and you may not always agree with the con general consensus, but that uh, I think you know, what what's important is is to pool is is to keep you know everyone inside the tent, uh, and uh, as far as possible. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't have you know, a, anyone can make make their their voice heard uh, on the internet if they want to. But I, I think in terms of civil protection, it needs to be very clear lines of command and communication. And this was very much uh, a lesson that's being learnt in the Canary Islands because of course we had the volcanic emergency in El Hierro. Uh, and the problem, there was lots of problems associated to that back in the day because, um, you know, perhaps the National Geographic Institute wasn't paying enough attention to what was going on in terms of volcanology in the Canary Islands and you had a local institution who dedicated their careers to studying it. Um, but yet the Spanish Institute had precedence uh, and I think that led to a lot of tensions. So a lot of lessons were learnt from the El Hierro eruption, weren't, weren't they? I, I don't know the details of El, El Hierro, but uh, it's it's you know pretty common where there are different groups. There can be university groups, uh, uh, so academics who you know maybe have some role in in monitoring. There can be uh, government agencies, more local agencies and institutes, uh, mm -hmm. and they're different people. Some may feel they have more of a vested interest because they're right there, they're part of the community. Uh, others may feel they know more because they've worked on other volcanoes around the world uh, that are erupting. I mean, there aren't that many, uh, it's not that frequent to get volcanic eruptions in the Canaries. And so, of, of, of course, in these uh, scenarios, you, you get different viewpoints and, uh, and egos, you know, start to, to come to the fore. And I think that's why what, what's very valuable is, is to have uh, in place already um, some kind of structure, committee structure, uh, where you draw on and keep everyone inside the tent and uh, draw collectively on, on different expertise people have. And that, that could be someone quite junior at a volcano observatory who maybe hasn't been to other volcanoes around the world but knows a lot about the particular volcano and the particular way that uh, knows, knows all the limitations of the data sets. Um, but also equally can be someone who has experience from Iceland and the Caribbean and uh, reunion, you know, other, other places where, well, I, I, I've seen a lot of eruptions, so, you know, I, you, I can bring this to, to the table in terms of understanding this, this new situation. And you've obviously been following it perhaps from abroad. Um, how do you feel the messaging has been received abroad? Have you felt that there's been that one message or have you seen conflicting reports which have confused the, the central theme? I've I've been uh, I mean apart from my my brief visit to La Palma uh, I've I've been uh, pretty wrapped up in a new academic year with uh, uh, with with students actually physically here again and so it's it's been it's been hard to kind of really follow the situation um, I mean what I saw uh, my my sense was actually the, the the scientific side was working was working pretty well because. Uh, you know, there, there's, there has been acrimony in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the global volcanological community and anywhere you go you'll find dissent and people who think they know better than someone else and I know that's, that's certainly been the case in the past within Spain um, and what I saw you know, seemed to be actually playing pretty nicely together. But for example if you have something in social media talking about, I don't know, a lava tsunami and a real close up to a lava flow is that helpful? Um, I don't think it's desperately helpful. I mean, uh, I'm not quite sure. I've never heard a lava tsunami before, but I guess, you know, lava, if a block tumbles in, it'll create a wave. Um, 
I mean, that's the first point, isn't it? Lava tsunami doesn't mean anything. So if you're an if you're a publicly funded institution, why are you using a term like lava tsunami? First of all, other than to grab attention to your lovely close up. Uh, and secondly, I don't think tsunami is the word we want associated with La Palma because we've spent the last eight years trying to convince people not to associate the word tsunami with La Palma. Uh, yeah, I mean, language matters. I mean, I'm not sure, sure, you know, if you said pyroclastic flow, that doesn't necessarily you know, mean much to a lay person. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, if, if you're communicating with the public, I guess, you know, the first question is, uh, who's your audience? Why are you communicating with them? And what's your message? And, uh, and, and do you, you know, do you have a, really have a place to be, um, you know, pontificating outside of the, you know, the scheme of the, the actual risk management, the official risk management. Mm. But the phrase, a phrase like lava tsunami is not a responsible phrase to use, would you say? I don't know. I mean, if, if, if it's, if it's uh, qualified, you know, this is what I mean by it. And um, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, not, it's not a term that we use routinely in, vol in volcanology, but, uh, but sometimes people want to explain things in, in ways that uh, might be more meaningful to the lay, lay public, lay audience. Uh, but yeah, if, if the aim is simply to, to get some news coverage and, and sensationalise, then that's not necessarily helpful to the, the overall crisis management. Precisely. Yeah, thank you very much. We wanted to look at the um, traffic light system uh, because there is a very particular volcanic traffic light in place, system in place in, in the Canary Islands. Could you just talk us through that? Because it's not the same everywhere in the world, is there? So they have this traffic light that goes green, yellow, orange, red. Um, what's, ha, ha, does that work well, do you think, in the Canary Islands, that traffic light? Is it something you've looked at or spent any time thinking about? I, I haven't looked at the specific alert system in, in the Canaries or that's been put in place for La Palma. Uh, there, around the world, there's, you know, there's a, a fair degree of um, integration of different alert systems. Some might have three levels or four levels. Uh, and I think, um, you know, generally quite a lot of thinking goes into an alert level. Uh, how do you call it? What are the indicators that will May make you uh, lead you to change an alert level. What are the indications that might take you down? Uh, how do you get back again? Uh, and then, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean when you go to red? Uh, what does it mean in terms of um, the civil protection side? What does it mean for the the population that's that's threatened? And um, yeah, I, I would say that that there is a, you know. Uh, Generally, fairly sort of standardised view of you know be not you know baseline activity business as usual. Uh, well, things are looking a little bit unsettled, so just be prepared, and then you know going to a higher le level that might key into evacuation. Exactly. So there's four levels in the Canary Islands: green, yellow, orange, red, <coughs> and the sort of default position is green. Um, that could lead you to think nothing to worry about. You don't even have to think about living on a volcano because it's green. So it means nothing is put in position. The education things don't come into play. Green is a bit unhelpful if you're in an active volcanic territory, isn't it? I think this then comes down to um, you know, societal risk tolerance and, uh, and perception. Uh, and this is something that's quite different in different parts of the world. Uh, and um, uh, you know, I, I think it it also comes down to what what people understand by it and how it how it's you know, if it's explained. Uh, well, yeah, you're living on a on a volcano, but it goes off. You know, every every few decades, um, we're in green at the moment. It means you go about your your business as usual. I, I don't. I I think as long as the um, the interpretation of these these alert levels is understood is generally understood you know in terms of responses and responsibilities uh. but it's not the difficulty of green you know if i was a politician making big decisions on public money and let's not forget the canary islands have a huge amount of public money because they are you know i think they have the most number of five star hotels per square kilometer in the south of tenerife than madrid or barcelona i mean the public purse has been considerable um, 
And if I have a scientist saying to me, oh no, the volcanic alert is on green, my view would be, oh, I don't even need to think about that. Whereas in fact they should be thinking and putting certain things into play. So is it not unhelpful to have something that says green? I, I don't know whether it's unhelpful or not. I mean, I think what can also be unhelpful is, is to uh, you know, tell people to live in fear all their lives. So I think you know, there's, there's another side to it. You know, do you make people anxious if you tell them, well, we're on yellow all the time? You know, that's just your baseline. Uh, so I, I think it comes, comes down to what, what makes sense within the societal context uh, and, and communicating you know, as clearly as possible what, what these things mean. Um, you know, I think I think what would be unfortunate is is if someone says, "Oh, I never realised I was living on a volcano," right? uh, or "I never realised this volcano could erupt ever again." Um, you know, then if if you have situations like that, then um, then you know the, the messaging hasn't really captured the situation. Yes. So if you have somebody saying, "I didn't know this was a volcano," something's gone wrong. Uh, yeah, I think something's gone wrong somewhere if you live on a volcano and they didn't realise it. Um, I mean, particularly if they're uh, an, an indigenous community who's gone to school there, I think it would uh, be quite sensible to talk about your local environment. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, um, from our point of view, um, it's not necessarily talking about green or yellow, but what green should mean. And green should presumably have something in, about preparedness and, and all the other things that we were talking about. Not just monitoring, but having a few general things, maybe a practice, all the things that we talked about before. Um, because you have green, which is go about as normal. Yellow, which is, oh, something might be happening. Orange, pack your bag, have a plan ready, get your house papers together and all the emergency services are on standby and red where you know, there's, an, there's a volcanic emergency. Mm -hmm. The problem we had in, in, in La Palma is that it was on yellow for that whole week. It erupted on yellow. So you had people who only had 15 minutes to get out of their house. The emergency services were overstretched. There was no plan of where these people should go or what they should do how they would be fed, how would they be supported. Um, yet we had people saying to us in the days before, it should be on at least orange. Um, is that a failure? Well, it's, it's always easy in hindsight. And I, I think you know, this comes back to decision making. Some, someone has got, you know, there is a person, unless it's a fully automated system uh, with AI or something like this, it uh, you know, just kicks out, okay, orange, red, uh, most likely there is a person underlying that who is um, probably a politician, I don't know, or I don't know how, how far the scientists and the volcano monitoring outfits get in, involved in that, uh, clearly going to have provided the information. Um, but then someone has to make that decision. Do we go from, do I know enough to know that we should go up a level? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball and someone's telling me this, someone's telling me that. Um, so I, I think it's, it's always easy to say in hindsight, well, we didn't, you know, we did, we actually did a great job or we did a, you know, better than nothing job uh, or somewhere in between. Um, but, but saying, you know, the, the alert system has failed, I, th I think is, is, you know, without knowing you know, more about digging into what, who made decisions and what they were based on. You know, I mean, it, it, there was this case of the, the L'Aquila uh, earthquake in Italy some years ago where there was some um, foreshocks and, and uh, people were quite, you know, quite worried and the scientists from civil protection went over and people were asking, well, you know, uh, should I sleep outside tonight? Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and this, you know, comes down again down very much to communication. What, what do you, you know, if you say, well, I don't know, we can't predict earthquakes. You know, we can just say you're living in a seismic area. Then, um, then the response is, well, why do we even have an agency to, to you know, map and monitor faults and, and record earthquakes? Yeah. So what's the point of having a volcanic alert system if it's erupting on yellow though? Because it means that we're putting something in place which perhaps gives people a false sense of security. Oh, it's on yellow, I don't need to worry. But it's erupted. So maybe that has to be thought about. I, I mean, in every crisis is going to be lessons, lessons to learn from things where you know, aspects that, that 
could have been managed better. Uh, I, I, but I, I think um, if, if, if in a, if in a mode of crisis escalates very rapidly, it can be very difficult to keep up with it, you know, and, uh, you know, even in five, ten minutes, half an hour, uh, the, the decision you made half an hour ago is already looking um, shaky, right? So I think, I think th this is very difficult when situations escalate very rapidly, which they can do in summer options. Oh yes, and that was certainly the case here, because normally you'd have months of felt earthquakes before you had an eruption, uh, and actually the main uh, risk was normally the earthquakes, not actually the volcano coming out. Um, and actually, uh, you know, I think IGN had put out a tweet an hour before saying, you know, we're still on yellow, it's fine. And of course, an hour or two later, it erupted. Uh, and there is a bit of revisionism going on because they're now having a timeline showing the 19th of Volcano uh, Alert was on red, which is not quite the case. So that's a bit unhelpful, I feel. <laughs> um, but, you know, we should be, we should have... We should be confident enough to have an analytical approach to this, don't you think? I mean, just going back and sort of saying it was red on the day, that's not very helpful, is it? Because actually it means we won't learn the lessons going forward. I, I think it, it, it's, um, it's, I, I think that, you know, it, that there needs to be a dialogue uh, between society and uh, the agencies that protect us and the scientists who do the monitoring, uh, because this volcanology is a very uncertain well, volcano hazard uh, eruption prediction is a very uncertain science okay? uh, there, there is no certainty no no one can say you know this is what the volcano is going to do in a week or a month uh, it's going to go this way or that way um, at, at the very best we, we can come up with scenarios and, and estimates and put them in probabilistic frameworks and, and so you know Part of the job there is, is to be able to communicate to the public, to civil protection authorities. Uh, this is this is the best we can do. You know, we, we we don't see directly what's going on three kilometers, five kilometers, ten kilometers below the surface, uh, and so I, I think that there needs to be a wider understanding of of scientific uncertainty, and and the job. The difficult job that decision makers have to have in um, making some decisions in, in in light of this uncertainty. So one of the things you need to do is be able to harness the uncertainty. Say yes, I I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, but um, what can we do to narrow the uncertainties? In the case in the case of a volcanic emergency, one one way to think about it is you know if you imagine it's a very simplistic view, but imagine that uh, uh, you're getting data. Uh, from the monitoring instruments, the seismometers, the gas measurements, and so on. Uh, and the more data you collect, maybe the more confidence you have in predicting what's going to happen. You've got more information, more evidence. Um, if it takes uh, a day to evacuate people, um, then this, this is also a, you know, a time frame. So at what point do you, you, know, do you balance the fact, well, if I wait, if I wait, I get a bit more information, but I'm narrowing the window potentially to being able to get everybody out in time, uh, and so when you think about it in those terms, it's it's it can you can formulate it as a kind of cost benefit problem, uh, and this this has been proposed as one way to kind of decide when when do you go to the next alert level, uh, but it's yeah it's not not easy to do that. So there are some local people who are saying, look, I'm angry because I've locked my house and I only had 15 minutes to get out and I don't have my house papers, I don't have my wedding album, I don't have the, you know, the money I had in my safe, whatever. But the authorities were already evacuating people who they knew to be vulnerable. So they knew something was happening about. So I feel cheated. I feel they knew something, but they didn't tell me, so I couldn't get ready. And what difference is it to them if it's on yellow or orange? If they told me it was on orange, I'd have paid attention and I'd have been ready. What would your answer be to somebody who feels aggrieved in that way? Because obviously there are limitations, but why, on the one hand, are the authorities evacuating some people, but other people feel, why didn't you tell me? Mm. Uh, I, I think that you know, this is the kind of thing that, that really you know, 
calls for a, for an inquiry, you know, to 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 learn the lessons. How how did this happen? Um, if it did somebody not get the receive the message or was was not deemed uh, at risk, uh, you know, what 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 were the circumstances? I, mean, I think um, we we. We um, assume everyone is connected on the internet and is going to be getting tweets and, and what have you, but of course that's not the case. You know, there, there are some people um, who are. Uh, we, we've seen this time and time again. You know, with Katrina, you know, it was assumed everyone just watches TV and when they say get out of Dodge, they all jump in the cars and go. Well, not everyone has a car. It turns out. Um, so. You know, thought always needs to get go into how, how how do you reach people how do you reach people in in a real crisis situation where there's very potentially very limited time um, and that's a really interesting point because the messaging um they have relied here for example on social media but also on these um Pivolka news reports uh, so it's uh, press uh, conferences which on the one hand are great because you have the real scientists standing up there and saying this is the science today this is what the volcano is doing today but there's two problems with that that we've seen on the one hand it's then journalists who ask the questions and interpret and their interest isn't always to be matter of fact should we put it that way mm -hmm. and secondly uh, those news reports then are um, shown on television and we have lots of locals saying the problem is the only place I can watch this because my I don't have my computer or I don't have my smartphone. You know, the only way I can see it is on the bar in the, on the TV. Um, and it's surrounded with images of my neighbor's house falling down. I don't want to see that every five minutes. And, and, and I'm not interested in what this um, very senior volcanologist is saying. I just want to know how this relates to me, my house, my life. Um, we need to do better on that messaging to the person on the street who isn't a scientist, who isn't engaged in that way. How can how can we think of that and put something in, or is there some, is that something you've thought about? Uh, the risk communication is it's not not my specialism. I, I think it, the thing is you never want to be in the situation where you're figuring out how to do it in in the emergency. So this is where um, working with communities beforehand is become so important and. Um, uh, you know, giving people some agency in also in in their risk management. Um, so so education and outreach and engagement with communities, I think, you know, is, is is really crucial and it's it's an ongoing thing, right? Because you might not need it for another fifty years. And actually, to be fair to them, there is there are programs in place certainly that the local volcanology institute has done, uh, and they go around every single municipality in the Canary Islands saying, "Oh." Our volcanologists are going to be here. We're going to tell, talk to you about. I think the program is called now Ventana al Atlantico, um, and maybe just one or two people turn up. Mm -hmm. So isn't it everybody's responsibility? It's not just they have to tell us they have to protect us. If I choose to live on a volcanic island, it is also my responsibility to know what that means and keep myself safe and be informed. A bit of sort of caveat emptor is that part of the equation? I th there, there are great complexities in, in you know, protecting communities uh, from volcanic threat or, or other kinds of threat. And, you know, there have been cases where people have been, you know, more or less forcibly told, told to leave. Uh, and they've, they've then brought litigation against the authorities. You know, this, you, I, I didn't want to leave. I was quite happy to take my chances here. Um, I think you know this. This um, it's a big deal to tell someone you've got to leave your house, and you've got to, you know you've got ten minutes or you've got a day. You know you can't bring bring your dog or whatever, leave your livestock behind. Um, that that's that's a huge ask. Right? So so you already need some kind of contract between um, the the authorities and and the community, and that you know, brings in in all the stakeholders. Uh, and I, th I think um, I think it's very a very complex area because you know, the, there's there's sort of a, a one movement is well okay if we're going to get sued for telling people to evacuate then we won't tell them to do it it's their responsibility you know put some information out there you have your own citizens jury uh, and I think you know this becomes very dangerous it's kind of abrogation of responsibility of, of experts who 
uh, of course, are not going to have a perfect um, uh, prognosis, but will have you know be best placed to um, look at the data and say oh, this, this is what we think could happen in an extreme scenario or a less extreme scenario. Hmm. But surely if you're telling people they've got 15 minutes and they should go, you should have some plan in mind of where they're going to. Sure, and a means of how they get there and, then what, and how long are they going to be away from. And, and, and it, absolutely. Yeah. So we currently have a situation where, you know, hundreds of people are still at a hotel very far south of the island. I mean, yeah. how do they go to school? How do they run their jobs, their lives, living in a hotel? Is that a failure of, of preparedness? It's, it's uh, yeah, I guess, you, you, you know, you could, you could label it a failure of preparedness. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, you've got to balance it against the, the, the what, what, what's the long-term probability of this? What are all the other things that we need to spend money on and worry about? Um, it's, it's very easy to say that we didn't prepare for this, but there's a whole lot of other things that, that were done, you know, that people were grateful to, to benefit from. And, um, yeah, I mean, an asteroid could sort of come <laughs> straight here right now, and uh, we'd say, well, that, you know, nobody told us that was going to happen. That, that, that's, so I, th I think um, it, it's, 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 a, it's a problem with these um, low probability, high magnitude events. You know, how, how do you best prepare for them and and uh, and particularly as you get to the real sort of catastrophe risk uh, it's it's almost it's you know becomes a sort of vanishingly small probability of a, an event but uh, a, an almost infinite magnitude of impact mm. and and you end up well you know it's like sort of multiplying zero by infinity you know, you get, how, how do you how do you contextualize that kind of a risk with um, all the other things that are going on. Well, to be fair, we've had three eruptions in La Palma now within living memory, so it is quite a real risk. It's not sort of something that might happen in a hundred years or a thousand years. You know, there's one in 149, one in 71, and now in 2021. We had another in El Hierro as well in 2011, which coincidentally came came up under 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 the sea. Um, so it wasn't a subaerial eruption. Um, but we were lucky in a sense that it came up where it did in La Palma, even though we have mm. seen uh, destruction, because two or three kilometres along there was a, a town. Mm. You, you know, if that had come up there, the, the potential for disaster would have been much greater, wouldn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the impact of an eruption obviously is going to depend on, on the, the nature of the built environment around it and where people are and facilities and infrastructure. Uh, so. This comes down to, um, yeah, I mean, taking a long-term view. If you take a long-term view, a very long-term view, I mean, if you if you look at Mauna Loa, let's say in, in Hawaii, you look at the geological map of it. Uh, they pretty much mapped all all of the the surface is covered with lava. You know, all of its lava, but um, the individual lava flows are mapped and they're more or less dated. Mm -hmm. You can see what well, over over a five thousand year time scale. You know, most of the the flank of the volcano is has at some point a lot of flows come down there. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, that, and that's the kind of information you can take, use towards long, long-term planning, long-term la land use planning. Absolutely, and this is something we think is critical because in the past we've talked about historic eruptions in the Canary Islands not having much of a, an impact on people and on lives, but that's because they were sparsely populated. The reality is that this and future eruptions are more likely to be urban eruptions with people, houses, infrastructure uh, in the way and that kind of changes the equation and that sort of quickens the, the attention span, doesn't it, a bit? Volcanic risk increases all the time because global population is increasing. You know, so you, you, the volcanoes, there's, there's no evidence in the last two, two and a half thousand years that, that there are more eruptions now than there were a thousand years ago. Uh, so they're going to keep popping up here, there and everywhere, but there are more people, you know, more, con more in urban areas and on, in coastal areas where a lot of volcanoes are. And so um, yeah, this problem isn't going to go away anytime soon. Brilliant, yes, thank you. Um, we just wanted to talk briefly about science and policy, which is I think something that you're, uh, you've been involved in. And the communication of science to policymakers is very important in terms of decision making. 
Um, do you think that's been successful here in La Palma, or have you not followed it closely enough? Uh, yeah, not in the La not in the Spanish context. Uh, I mean, the, the general comment I make about science and policy is um, again this this question of um, how how long political for authorities are authorities before they, there's a change of personnel and, and loss of information and knowledge uh, and engagement and um, with with uh, low probability high impact events it's it's difficult to kind of contextualize those you know on a, on a five-year political agenda for, for example uh, which is crowded with plenty of other pressing concerns yeah and that boundary between science and policy is is really interesting um, so if we think about something we touched on before in terms of land identity in La Palma, we said that people feel very identified there. Uh, and one of the big discussions going forward is going to be what happens to the people who've lost their homes there. And we've spoken to people who said, I absolutely want to go and you know plant my flag and have my house on top of my old house. I don't care that it's sort of 15 metres down. Um, how far is it the responsibility of the authorities to put back things exactly as they were? Uh, and how far do we say, tough, you weren't insured, we'll give you a little bit of money, but go and find your own way? In, in terms of the, the aftermath when it, the, of this eruption, when, when it's all over, what, um, what happens to the, the displaced population? I mean, the, 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 there will be, I'm sure there will be people who will want to go back to their, their piece of land uh, and, and, and reclaim it and you know, clearly this is uh, going to require an awful lot of infrastructure. Right? I mean you, even if you said okay well we'll forget that this could happen again we'll just build back how it was. You know, you know, all the water and roads and, and uh, schools etc. You know, it, it's um, I think you know we, we when, when, when there are these kinds of catastrophes you know in conflict as well okay the mosque has been destroyed um, there's an opportunity to build it back just how it was, or do we take the opportunity to make it a bit bigger, put some new toilets in? You know, I think the, you know, so part of it is it needs a lot of thought uh, of what do you want to build back um, and, and how, and, and obviously you know, there will be financial constraints on, on this as well. Yes, because what people haven't been taking into account is the effort that goes into turning a lava field mm -hmm. into a banana plantation, for yeah. example. So from Madrid, it might be very easy to say, oh, I'll give you X amount of money, go and buy yourself a flat, mm -hmm. and I feel that I've done my job as a politician. When the reality is, um, you know, that person's father and his grandfather probably did a lot of backbreaking work, and they're now talking about it costing half a million euros just for one hectare of mm -hmm. lava field to be turned into a banana plantation. So people haven't just lost their homes they've lost their livelihood mm -hmm. and their communities going forwards so just shoving them in a tourist complex that the government has bought for them isn't the right answer is it everything needs to be done to support the people who've lost their livelihoods their homes their land um, i think it also has, has to be recognized things things will never be the same again uh, you know what, whatever you do there'll, there'll be um, if you've got a fresh lava flow that's going to be cooling over the next you know, 20 years, uh, it's, it's just going to be impractical to build a property on it uh, or, or uh, uh, reconstitute a banana plantation on it. Um, th things will never be the same. You know, and there will, there will be, uh, the community will never be the same because there will be some people who never go back. They'll, they'll end up uh, on the mainland or they'll end up on another island. And I think that that's... I think you know that when you look at that in the broader context, that's kind of history, right? You know, migration, mobility. Um, people have had to um, up sticks and, and go somewhere else. Um, Monster, I think of Montserrat in in the Caribbean right, where I worked um, over a period of years, and the the capital was obliterated, and people moved to the north of the island, and they've tried to redevelop and resettle it, but it was much more rugged terrain. Um, 
but the demography is, is different. You know, a lot of those now Spanish is kind of the second language there because a lot of people moved in from Venezuela doing construction. A lot of people never came back, um, ended up in, in the UK or Canada or other parts of the Caribbean. So it's, it's um, I think it's difficult to think about, it's, I want it to be just like it used to be. I think you know, that, that's probably unrealistic in, in most situations where there's a large scale disaster. Yes, exactly. So um, there's a lot of uh, conflict at the moment with, with the government saying, actually, we're just going to turn this into a national park. Um, would it take, you mentioned 20 years, if they, if they wanted to put it back the way that, that, that it was, say if it was possible in an ideal world, magic wand, would it take as long as that for the lava flow to, to cool down? The, the rate at which lava flows cool, it's, it's all thermodynamics and it's... it's uh, heat losses and, and so on. Um, so, I mean, a thick lo thick lava flow, it's, it's going to be cooling and contracting, contracting over quite a long period. Uh, and a flow field um, you know, is, is also a lot of complexity to it. And these, these, the lava flows that I saw, at least, you know, some of them were remarkably thick. So that's not going to be super stable uh, ground for some time. And uh, it's not, not easy to imagine yeah, any time soon, just building back how, how things used to be. Um, but you know that that said, uh, there there are places like you know, in, in on Etna where there are quite regular lava flows that come down and, and cut the road or cut tourist facilities. Um, yeah, there there are, there are ways to re-engineer the the environment. Sure. So let's talk first of all. You know how responsible is it um, for scientists to to take pictures of themselves and publish them uh, right at the lava front in not very, you know, without all the sort of astronaut kit on, you know, does it lull people into a full sense of security? There, there's a halo effect when, when scientists, you know, go into the field uh, uh, and they're, they're obviously, you know, getting access in, in an exclusion zone um, where it's been permitted and uh, I mean, per I, I personally, I mean, I'm, I barely use social media so I, I'm just not not that generation where I'd even think uh, you know that I, I want to take a selfie and, and show it um, and, and I suspect pe people anyone who does do that kind of thing you know, at some point in the future they'll reflect on anything that that wasn't a brilliant idea um, because it's it's I don't I don't you know unless unless there's some communi you know real communication aspect to it uh, some educational point uh, then you know, I, th I think yeah, it, it's that, that's not what you're there for. It's you're there to make some measurements and collect observations that are I either part of the scientific uh, program or part of the operational surveillance. Um, yeah, and I, I, I suspect people have gone in there and, and you know have, have given an impression that um, well, yeah, so and so went in, got this close, and uh, I, I can do it illegally. And, uh, that's clear. You, you know, it's very difficult to stop people doing that. But if if they've been lulled into a false sense of security because that, because they've seen scientists doing that, that's not great, is it? No. And I, well, it's it's. Um, yeah, I think it's important. You know, any, anyone who's in an exclusion zone has has a reason to be in there, and that, that you know, it needs to be clear, I guess, um, to the outside world, look, yes, there are people going in, but they're doing it because they're emergency workers or they're, they're scientists who, who have, you know, have been authorised to, uh, to go in and collect measurements as part of the operational surveillance of the volcano. So then if, if a local person has decided to, as we said, walk across the lava because they felt, oh, it must be safe, what dangers could they have encountered walking over a, a lava flow that was just a few days old? If, if you walk across a fresh lava flow, I, I'd say you know, the number one uh, possible injury is, just, is, is a fall uh, and, and getting a nasty cut because this stuff is very, can be very loose. It can have, on some lavas you have a, a very thin shell that you can break through and then it's like glass. Uh, so, so sprains, uh, broken limbs, you know, but th this is the most likely thing. Uh, then, of course, if the lava is hot, um, burn burn injuries. Um, I'd say it's it's generally pretty 
it's, it's pretty rare that people have ended up um, you know, stepping through in, into molten lava, but uh, uh, you know, if you can see the stuff is red hot, you'd be absolutely crazy, of course, to, to walk across it. Yes, but the, even if it's black on the top, there might still be a lava tube, a live lava tube running underneath, right? Yeah, if, if, there's, if, it, if it's crusted over at the top, then you know, it, depending on the kind of lava flow, it would be possible to go through a roof over a, a lava tube. Uh, this, this would be certainly possible somewhere like Hawaii. And uh, I actually know someone who did, did that, a scientist who, who put two feet into the lava going through uh, the crust. Um, I would say these more rubbly flows uh, and blocky flows um, you know, the, the, this is just horrible terrain to cross and, and it's going to be a lot of heat and, and still some residual gases coming off and uh, um, yeah, the, the chances of a burn injury are, are high, the, the chances of um, having a, 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 a nasty fall and, and getting cut up on, on these very sharp glassy rocks is also high. And also the, the gases because something that I found extraordinary early on is that you had all of these images of scientists close up without any sort of gas mask on um, and obviously the gases can be an issue not outside the exclusion zone as much if it's sort of you know um, uh, sort of dispersed um, but surely scientists should be responsible in terms of using gas masks and you know making sure they have the proper equipment specifically if they're going to put something on social media and, and that people are going to see you know when when scientists work in the field, I mean, we we um, th there is many years ago uh, the International Association of Volcanology um, got a, a group of people together, and there are published guidelines on on how to how to behave in in, in field work in in these kinds of crisis situations, and um, so I mean, in, in terms of the personal risk, I mean, being hit on the head. That's why we we take uh, hard hats. Um, to protect from, from projectiles coming from the volcano, um, a, a gas mask as, as protection against the, the gases. Um, so, so you would you would have you know you, you want to be in communication as well. You have a radio. You'd have to if, if you're doing work close up, then then you you, you you do it after you've evaluated the risk, the personal risk, the risk if someone has to come and pull you out. Uh, and and um, I, I would say, you know, except in extreme situations like Chernobyl, I mean, no, no measurement is so desperately important. It's worth risking your life or the lives of others who have to come and get you afterwards. That's exactly the point. So if you have scientists sort of rushing to get as close as possible to something, um, is there ever a, a scientific reason valid enough to A, put their own life in danger, B, if you're the boss of an institution telling people to get that close, that's not very responsible, but also then means people have to come and haul you out. I, I would say in general, you know, that, that observatories um, will, their, their staff will, will not do things just on, off their own bat. They will have, you know, there will be very relative, you know, clear protocols about where you can go, where you can't go, um, staying in communication all the time with the observatory and so on, but there, there are some, um, uh, we have now quite a lot of remote sensing techniques, we can use satellites, but, you know, it might be the satellite only goes over once a week, so in a, in a very rapidly evolving situation you want much more frequent data than that, and it might be you need to use ground-based instruments where you need to be closer, uh, you might want to collect rock samples, then you've, you know, you've got to get, again, in range of where those lava flows or the stuff is falling out of the sky. So just to run through it, if, if you're going to be that close, what should you be wearing, for example, to keep yourself safe? There must be guidelines around that. Uh, if, if, you're, if you're working in, I, I would say the most, the most basic guidelines for, for doing field work on an erupting volcano are a, a, a hard hat, uh, you know, suitable footwear and clothing and, uh, and, a, and a gas mask. Um, the, the gas mask is, is something that, um, you know, I will, I will have a gas mask with me, but I'm not necessarily wearing it all the time because it's it's uh, it's only necessary if you if you you know really get the the few the wind blows the fumes towards you, so you have it there as um, you have use of it when you need it. Uh, it can be quite uncomfortable 
uh, hiking across um, you know, a, a volcano with a gas mask on and, or climbing up, you know, which is quite strenuous and you're carrying some equipment. Uh, but you would want to have one with you uh, in, in case there's a change of wind direction. Mm. So it just strikes me that this eruption is different to other eruptions because it's a bit like the sort of... Um, I remember seeing, this really dates me, the first images of the Gulf War and mm. you'd see these aircraft with pin type decision and we thought, wow, they've got this sort of screen and they can drop a bomb and it goes exactly here. Suddenly this is, uh, this is everywhere on social media. Everybody has a smartphone, everybody has a camera, um, and that interferes uh, with the messaging uh, as well. Um, so do you think perhaps some sort of training for uh, social media and um, that sort of messaging should be important for the institutions as well to make sure that they only publish photographs that are responsible in terms of having long sleeves, a gas masks, so that they don't give the wrong image and make people feel things are less of a threat than they actually are? I think there's you know, a, ge a general wide understanding that you know, research ethics are important uh, and so that, that's uh, if you're working on an active volcano um, in Antarctica, okay, I mean maybe there's not such an ethical situation but you still evaluate the risks. Uh, I might have um, uh, PhD students that I'm working with that uh, you know, I, I don't want to put in, in unnecessary harm's way but you, you work on a volcano uh, of course, it's it's um, it's not like uh, you know playing <laughs> swing ball in the garden necessarily. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it's more dangerous playing swing ball. Certainly, when I play. Ball in the face. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yes. So, if we could just sum up from what you've seen uh, and your experience of being in La Palma, what are your big takeaways that we can learn from it? What do you think are your sort of points we should take away from this? I, I think something that, you know, the things that I take away from the La Palma crisis are that, that ev every volcano, every eruption, every crisis is different and, and has its own uh, idiosyncrasies and particularities in terms of the, uh, what the volcano is doing, what, what the um, civil protection agencies and scientists are doing and thinking and, and obviously the, the communities of population that's um, being impacted uh, what they're doing um, so you, you you know you learn something from everyone every every eruption and I, I think um, in this case I, I was you know, very struck by okay we're on a you know relatively small island um, out in the Atlantic Ocean and you know, Africa's the nearest bit of continent over there um, and it, it, it was very very complex you know, a relatively small eruption but incredibly complex already in terms of the, um, the eruption it's going on for a long time it's developing it's uh, this part is being inundated with lava and then the next bit and then the next bit and then it reaches the sea uh, all, all the agencies, the NGOs, the various levels of government, organisation, the scientists, the media, uh, you just realise, you know, this is so complex, it's so complex, and it's very difficult to to do what, you know, in hindsight, someone said, well, that was the right thing. You know, mm. it's, they're messy, messy situations, and, um, uh, pe yeah, people's lives get turned upside down in a way that will never be the same again. Just very finally, that's one thing I did mean to pick up with you, mm. is the fact, obviously, all the news crews in the world descended on La Palma, um, and you had suddenly very senior people, most of their time, being taken up on news interviews. Mm. Um, should we not just have one central agency running interviews and, and leaving these people to do their job, rather than talking to CNN and BBC, and because all of them want to speak to the person in charge of whatever. Mm -hmm. But then that means that person can't do the job they have to do in this very complex eruption. Mm. Yeah, I, I, you, the La Palma situation was one where you know it was very high profile internationally, and um, you know, I, I ran into various uh, media crews out there, and, and I, I purposefully didn't give any interviews because uh, I, I wasn't doing operational surveillance. I, I didn't want to uh, get engaged. Um, or feel it was my place to. Um, 
I think that you know you, you could say well there should be a media manager who who handles all of the all, all of the, the interviews um, and then you know very quickly though you can get you can get accused of ah oh, this is media manipulation and it's it's uh, spin doctoring um, and there, there, there is you know, I think there's something to be said for hearing from from scientists but I think it it, it still needs to be in in a somewhat coordinated way you know not just some scattergun thing that uh, uh, anyone you know potentially someone you know who's very opinionated or someone with less less experience who who gets you know out of their depth on on camera you know potentially to a wide audience um, so I, I would say in some ways it, it's um, I mean, I, again, I remember thinking my experience on Montserrat, the ra local radio station, uh, you know, they, they were terrific, right? You know, they, and they would um, interview the scientists in the observatory, the technical staff, the visiting scientists, and, and so on. Um, and the population became very, very volcano literate. I mean, if, if anywhere uh, on Earth, you know, you could survey the population and find 100% of them know what a pyroclastic flow is, it's, it's, you know, it's um, Soufre Hill on, on Montserrat Island. Uh, so I, th I think, yeah, that, you know, clearly media communication is, is very, very important. Um, and people do want to know what's going on and I think have a right to know what's going on. But, but some, somewhere between uh, free for all and very tight, uh, you know, top down media control, I think is, is what's appropriate. I was going to say, we've just got a couple of minutes left. I've got um, something that's been building up in my head mm -hmm. that I just wanted to get out of the way before. Yeah. Um, I went to an Ilvolcan meeting and they had this graph mm -hmm. with these little dots showing where the, vol where the seismic eruptions are going, following up the lava. And then um, I heard about this, this traffic light thing and I heard about the warning. And if I'm taking the viewpoint of a non-scientific, you know, kind of hoi polloi, look, we're going to be able to, they are, everyone's going to be able to see this data at some point, he said. How is it not obvious, looking at the, tra you know, from 30 kilometres down to 10 kilometres to 2 kilometres, that there's an eruption coming? Yet, no one was talking about it, and they were saying, oh, no, we're slowly getting into the thing. It seemed to me to be patently obvious, looking at these little dots, mm -hmm. there was an eruption coming. So what on earth were they doing? You know, wh why didn't they change the 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 um, the clock, what, the the traffic light? And uh, it sounds like they just asked covering because it was obvious it was coming. So what reason on earth could they have not changed it? Yeah, I, I don't you know I don't know the details, but I, I would say you know, it, it's um, it's not obvious that it's coming. The, the, uh, an eruption, you know, there the might, if you've got uh, every, all your data telling you, and you're maybe you're seeing these earthquakes coming up towards the surface, right? You know, there are things that would say, okay, I was thinking maybe a 10% chance, now I think it's 50 because I can see this migration of earthquake uh, depths. Um, it, it's it's um, also, you know, a, a week is not a desperately long period of time if, if you. Uh, uh, haven't already had some precursory activity. A week is a pretty short time to think. Okay, I've got a cluster of earthquakes here. There's quite a lot of inflation as well. I think it was up to 15 centimeters, and quite a few other, you know, precursors that were fairly clear that. Yeah, I think it was I think hotting up. Yeah, but I, I think it's still very. It's a very short time scale. I mean, if if you compare with Iceland, I mean, it, you know, I'd say I don't remember the exact figures, but certainly six. Six months beforehand, thing there was seismicity. There was you know cl things were clearly rattling around, and they were over here and over here, and then clustering here. Mm. Uh, a, a week where things you know okay, we've got a, an earthquake swarm. There are many. It, it's very typical of getting an earthquake swarm. Um, the volcano is readjusting somewhere, and it and it goes back to sleep again. Um, I thought like, one thing that I found interesting um, is. Like your work with Amy Donovan kind of on that boundary between science and policy um, and like your work on Montserrat where you kind of have looked at land identity kind of and the role of land identity and models like kind of you mentioned donation maps earlier on and like evacuations so how do you then incorporate kind of kind of more nuanced ideas such as land identity or sense of place into these types of models or kind of we've talked about banana plantations you know the agency of the banana farmers themselves, their knowledge, yeah. but how well do you think that's been incorporated into the response to this eruption and going forward, 
how do you incorporate these more kind of nuanced, abstract kind of ideas into scientific models? We're, we're not going to tell you whether to wear any gas mask. You, you, you want to go get COVID? To, that's it's not a government responsibility anymore. So it's, mm. but you know, they're very difficult. How, where's the where, where's the right line? I, I don't think they're easy questions. Right? Um, What's your view, though? My my view on on preparedness of volcanic eruptions is is that it, it needs to be thought through very very carefully and it needs to engage with all the stakeholders uh, otherwise you know someone is left out of the picture when when a, a crisis develops and so clearly some of the most crucial stakeholders are the threatened communities uh, so there needs to be a dialogue and there needs to be um, outreach and, and engagement and, and discussion about well, you know, maybe maybe you've never seen this volcano erupt before. You know, it was fifty years ago, and you're only twenty five, right? You don't you haven't seen it happen, um, but it could happen. And this is what happened fifty years ago. This is what's happened somewhere else in the world, uh, and uh, this this can turn things upside down. You know, and, and uh, these are the kinds of things that you can do. Um, uh, to to prepare, um, these are the kinds of things you might have to do in the case of a of a crisis and emergency. Um, but also, you know, tell us how you feel about it. What what what? How do you see it from your perspective? How disruptive would it be? Where would you go? What would you need to take with you? Um, uh, just you know, a little detail is in um, uh, this you know being the case in many again many volcanic crises people have been evacuated but not their livestock and so they go back you know they, they go back and check that their cows and goats are all right and um, that means they're coming back into harm's way um, and uh, going into an exclusion zone how, how, how do you manage that should, should we be evacuating more of people's assets uh, well, and that's a really topical subject because people have been allowed back in to sweep ash on their roof mm -hmm. uh, off uh, to protect their houses. But we had somebody who sadly passed away a few days ago and it's not clear yet whether he was overcome by gases or fell off the roof. Um, should we be stricter in terms of the gas masks that they wear if they're allowed to sweep off their ash? Should people be put in harm's way again just to sweep ash off their roof? I mean, from the outside, somebody might say, that's absurd, you know, keep people safe, forget about the housing. Um, what's the right response to something like that? It's difficult to keep people away from their properties. People want to see, uh, you know, is everything still there? Is things how they've left them? Uh, do they need to sweep ash off the roof to, to protect the structural integrity of the building? Uh, and um, climbing up on roofs is, you know, it's an inherently dangerous thing to do. I know several of my friends who've fallen off ladders. Uh, I, I worry, would worry more personally if I had to clean the gutter than doing my volcano field work. I just you know, I think gravity and <laughs> a wobbly ladder or a dodgy roof that's already been partly corroded by acid coated ash is, is, uh, is a risky thing. And um, you know, if, if when, when you allow people to go back in, as, as everyone is clamouring to be allowed back, back in to see you know, is everything intact or not, um, it's, again, it's a difficult balance. You let people go back in, put themselves at risk, or um, but they need to, they want to, uh, or do you, you know, be a bit more authoritarian and say, well, you know, for your own good, I don't think you're very good, you should just wait, wait another month, another six months. It's been the same with the uh, banana growers, of course, because there have been areas of plantation which have been cut off, and you've had uh, the army boating, you know, shipping people around to a, an area where they can access them and um, bringing sort of desalination plants and trying to set them up in the field so that they had access to water. Mm -hmm. um, should we be doing that with people? Is that a good use of public funding, or should we be just saying, look, forget about your crop this year? We'll, we'll foot the bill for however many bananas it is you're going to lose. It doesn't make sense to have the army bring people around to water their bananas, does it? In in the case of uh, maintaining banana plantations, I, I don't know. You know what the are there cost benefit 
calculations that go into this or or is it also sentiment and uh, um, and I really don't want you know all I spent years and years getting these you know bananas to the mature state I know they grow pretty quickly but I'm sure there's an enormous amount of work to make a viable operation um, and a little maintenance will just make that viable rather than having to start from scratch um, but I, I, I think you know the, the, these are questions that need to be looked at in in the round as to uh, what is that diverting resource from is it is it the most most pressing issue uh, is it is it more important to rescue a couple of dogs on a kipuka yeah. uh, than to look after um, uh, you know, elderly evacuees um, who are in close proximity in a school or a church building. And that comes back to the cost-benefit analysis you were talking about earlier. You know, if, there, if the eruption had gone on for two weeks uh, and you'd taken growers once to water their banana plantations, that might have a clear cost-benefit analysis. But the eruption has been going on for over two months now. People are saying to us, it could just keep going for a number of weeks, months, they don't know. And suddenly those calculations all start to change, don't they, as time goes on. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't want to overplay cost benefit analysis because you know what what's the what's the value of a person's life or a person's livelihood. I think you know these, these okay if you're an actuary then that's what you do, right? But I I think in normal life we don't really want to do that. I think what's what's sensible to do, right? And, and that you know, what's uh, what's what's sensible when you take into account the yes, the economic factors, um, but also the cultural factors and, uh, and what you have resource to, to do. Um. And the duty of care, because the whole mental health issue is, is important as well, isn't it? These are people, I mean, the last time we stayed, we actually stayed in El Paso. I don't think I had a good night's sleep in five nights. The windows, mm. as you were saying, like the windows are rattling. and yeah. um, So some of these things maybe just help people to feel something's being done and they're being supported at a time when it's very difficult to do everything they need all at once. Yeah, the psychological impacts of, of a crisis can, can be very profound and, and lasting and uh, so you know, this, is, this is something again in terms of um, response and the longer term response, uh, it can kind of get forgotten that, that um, being displaced from your community, seeing whole life change in, in, a, in, a, in a moment, um, uh, they're things that don't necessarily show on the outside and I'm sure you know, most, most people who, who are evacuees, uh, that, that must be something that, that stays with most people for a long time. Um, I, I spoke to a, a woman on Jaime in Iceland uh, where there was an eruption in 73 and um, it, it's the f famous one where they, um, they the fishing fleet had just come in, they evacuated everyone to the mainland um, and they sprayed um, seawater on the lava flows to try and stop them coming in. And um, men, many of the people who were evacuated stayed on the mainland for decades. Uh, and, I, and I spoke to one woman who, who was back on Jaime after, I don't know, come back after 30 years or something and uh, said, you know, I, uh, we never talked about it. You know, we felt a sense of shame uh, that we were refugees and we were put up in the, you know, accommodated in this new sort of apartment block and kind of, we never talked about it. Uh, so I, I, I'm sure this will have last, lasting impacts on uh, all, all the people who've been displaced. Mm, absolutely. There was just one issue I forgot to ask you about earlier, and it's to do with um, the product of the science that's being done at the moment. So we have lots of different science teams, um, and there is an element of competition in science, um, which can look a little ugly from the outside, because uh, everybody wants to be the first to publish, or everybody wants to be the first to think about or talk about this. Um, but should it be... Uh, First of all, is it important for all scientists in the exclusion zone to give the product of their science to Pavolka right now so that they have everything that's possibly available right now in order to make their decisions, first of all? And secondly, um, is competition in science good or, or is it just pitching scientists against each other in a scrabble for funding? So I think in any any scientist who's who's working in the exclusion zone 
if, if they have, if they're collecting observations that could be used in, as part of the operational surveillance, as part of the, the hazard assessment, uh, then it would be incumbent on, on them to, to share that with, with the agencies. And I mean, it's, it's, it's these agencies that are mandating, you know, authorizing them to go into the exclusion zone. So I would say, in, I mean, the cases that I know, there's been very, very close cooperation and immediate, um, I wouldn't even call it sharing of data, they're collecting data partly on behalf of the, uh, the monitoring operation um, and, and contributing ideas to interpretation and analysis of data. Um, but, you know, people like me, I, I, I'm based in a university, I don't, it's not my operational role to do this. And so I will also have an eye on uh, what can we learn from this? Can, can we synthesize um, uh, various observations, maybe from the, the rocks, studying the petrology of the lava, lavas that have been collected with the gas observations? And um, what, what can we gain from that that helps us understand better how volcanoes work? Uh, so I've um, uh, very, very recently actually I've been working with colleagues in Iceland and uh, we're working with the the, the Icelandic uh, colleagues who are leading leading this work. Um, there are many of us from, from Italy, from the UK and elsewhere that have been collaborating. And, um, you know, I think, you know, com competition in, 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 in every sphere is, is um, that's human nature. Um, but I think, I think generally I would say in volcanology, um, I don't think it's the most bad natured of, of sciences. I think there's, you know, there's quite a general sense of what's the common good. Uh, I don't always need to be the first author on this paper. Uh, and um, you know, I'm, I'm just glad, grateful and privileged to have been part of this, um, uh, this effort uh, and, and you know, making, making some new increment in our understanding of, of how volcanoes work. And volcanology is a young science. We don't have all the answers yet. When are things going to start, stop? All the big questions that you'd think uh, we, we just don't know that. Maybe it needs to be, uh, we encourage, a, we need to encourage a more multidisciplinary uh, approach. Pull people in from different uh, disciplines to, to add to the pot. Because there's lots we still don't understand about volcanoes, isn't there? there there's a great deal we still don't understand about how volcanoes work. And it's always humbling if you look at uh, the scientific literature from 200 years ago, they're asking the same questions, uh, what animates volcanoes that we're asking today. Uh, and yes, we've made tremendous advances and the, the technology has, has really gathered pace uh, using, using unoccupied aerial systems to go in and collect measurements that we could never collect before or using a synchrotron radiation facility to measure the minutest concentration of something that we could never analyze before. Uh, so so we're, we're learning, but we are still asking fundamental questions. So like, is this volcano going to erupt in the next two weeks? And if so, what, what's it going to be like? Um, and in terms of La Palma, it is heavily monitored, and thank goodness for that, because hardly any earthquakes in the lead up were felt. Mm -hmm. So there might have been deficiencies. We might say there might have been the odd deficiency in preparation, but actually, in terms of monitoring, thank goodness it was monitored. Otherwise, they'd have had no idea this was coming. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's um, you know without question the case that that uh, you know most I'd say most eruptions don't happen without some something that you could have detected uh, seismic activity, ground deformation, changing surface elevation of the Earth's surface, uh, or gas emanations, the chemistry changing. Um, but it requires the instrumentation uh, and the analysis and the interpretation to um, capitalize on that for the purposes of, of uh, forecasting volcanic activity. But I think we, you know, we've, made, we've made great strides. And I would also say actually volcanology is a tremendously interdisciplinary subject. I wouldn't say science because you know, it's, it's uh, people from the humanities and the social sciences uh, it's what I love about volcanology is I, I work with archaeologists, historians, mathematicians, uh, climate modelers. It, volcanology kind of interfaces with all of these different domains and for me that's where 
the excitement is at, at sort of interfaces and where there, there's a, a kind of gap in in epistemology and, and knowledge um, that uh, you, you, you have to figure out how to talk to each other even before you can collaborate. So it's, it's um, I, I would say also, I think volcanology, uh, maybe I would say this, but I think, I think in some ways it's l leading the way actually in, in, um, in risk management, nat let's say natural hazard risk management, uh, because I think we have been thinking about the, the social dimensions uh, a great deal now for you know at least twenty five years and, and I think um, uh, and maybe it's partly because volcanologists in observatories are part often parts of the community they serve to protect so they get it you know they get the science they also get the societal aspect and maybe one of the good things to come out of this eruption is that at a time when universities were closing down geology degrees and there's a bit of a sort of ground sort of change in how earth science is is taught. Maybe some of the images of La Palma will serve to infuse young, younger students, students at school, to question what's going on in La Palma and I want to know more, I want to study that. A, a great deal is learned with, with every volcanic eruption that, that, that's been a focus of scientific attention. Uh, I think of it a little bit like, uh, like warfare, okay, you know, great technological advances were made in, in, in the Second World War. You know. All, all these things that then radar and so on uh, that originally kind of grew out of military military applications um, and I think it's 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 similar with with volcanoes I mean eruptions like the long lasting affair on Montserrat the Sufre Hills volcano eruption uh, which was a huge focus of multidisciplinary work social science uh, natural science um, Mount St Helens uh, Pinatubo in the Philippines in 91, this taught us about how volcanoes affect uh, the global climate. And so we make great advances. And I think La Palma, you know, it, it, it is, it's uh, in, I would say in, in the world of volcanology, it's a big, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, and a lot, I'm sure, will be learnt from it, uh, both, both in terms of the fundamental science, but also the, the more applied side of it.